Good morning. Good morning. Merry Christmas. It's fun to say that now, isn't it? Decorations are up and getting on the Christmas spirit. So glad to see you here today. We sincerely hope everyone in this room feels welcome here. Whether it's your first time or your hundred thousandth time. And I didn't do the math on that. I don't know if that's possible in hundred thousand. But we want to connect with you. Whether you're here every week or this is your first time here, connect with us online. You can text if you want to connect with us that way. Text to 94,000, text the word Sweetwater. And then we also, if you're here in-house today, have a free gift for you out at our guest services desk. If you go by on the way out today, pick that up. It's in a nice little gift bag. And it's just our way of saying, hey, we're glad you came to visit with us today. You can also do prayer requests on our website. You're always welcome to call the church office, stop by and see one of us on site at service. But prayer request comes at 2 a.m. in the morning, you're awakened by something and you want that prayed for, you get a phone call, you need prayer. If you will go on the website and simply fill out that form, uh, the next day we will see that and we will pass that along in the staff. And if you give us permission, we'll send it to the entire church and that prayer need will be prayed for. You can also give online. You can give on site here in our nice offering uh, box thingies back there. I've got a very better name for those things. Is there a better name, Pastor Buddy? No. We're just, we're, we'll just keep calling them offering thingies. And we would, we would love for you to be able to give me worship that way. But also, if you do everything electronically, you can give online or by text on the number on the screens. Isn't it great to be here today? Let's pray. Lord, with all the busyness of December and Christmas, may we not forget that you are the reason for the season. It's in your name. Amen. <laughs> Amen, amen. How's everyone doing? Good, good. It's great to see your faces and the festive spirit here. I invite you guys to stand up as we sing some songs together. Is there joy in this house today? Yeah. Yeah. 
as we were singing it, it's such amazing grace, and dare I say scandalous grace, because we don't deserve it, right? <laughs> but it's this truth here. That, uh, what other king leaves his throne? What other king leaves his throne? What other king leaves his throne? Hmm. What other king leaves his glory to die? Isn't that powerful? And he left all glory for you. And since he died on that cross for you, all he sees now is just, when you look into his eyes, there's no eyes of condemnation. It's just eyes in Revelation, it talks about his eyes burn like wild fire for you. Fiery passion. That is our King. That is our Savior. What other King leaves his throne? What other King leaves his throne? What other King leaves his glory? What other king leaves his glory? Can we see that chorus one last time? This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place.
It's that great name that we lift up, Jesus. May you be adored and enthroned in this place, God. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. Morning, church. Morning. Feels a little like Christmas outside, right? Yeah, nice and brisk and chilly. Got all my red Christmas socks today. Matching glasses. <laughs> you know, one of the one of the criticisms that uh, we get, particularly at Christmas time is that if you think about the Christmas story, Mary, Angel, Joseph, the world doesn't buy it. It's impossible. Well, yeah. If it was possible, we wouldn't need God. So this morning's sermon is entitled, The Reality of the Impossible. We're going to start with Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the descendants of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And coming in, he said to her, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom will have no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy child shall be called the Son of God. And behold, even your relative Elizabeth has also conceived a son in her old age. And she who is called barren is now in her sixth month. For nothing will be impossible with God. And Mary said, Behold the bond slave of the Lord. May it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Let's pray. Lord, be with us so that we may have mustard seed sized faith, just a little bit of faith, so that we can believe. Believe in the reality of the impossible because faith. Faith is believing the things that we can't see. And the hope in things we can't touch. So be with us, Lord. Give us your spirit as we worship you. Give us your spirit so that we may hear from you. Forgive the failings and shortcomings of your messenger. Take your message as so many loaves and fishes and spread it out to all who are here, to all who are watching. So that we may hear from you this Christmas. Thank you, Father, in Christ's name. Amen. We Americans are sophisticated, scientific people. We don't buy in to all of that stuff that's just impossible. First, we Americans, we, we like to prove that through science we can overcome the impossible. 
Things that our great grandparents could not have imagined and they knew were impossible. We have made possible through our scientific and technological advances. As we speak, visionary scientists are setting their sights on other impossible things that they tend they intend to overcome. Talking a little bit earlier about uh, Elon Musk. He's one of those people. He's got an interesting little project going um, that we think maybe our son might have a little part in. We're not sure yet because he won't tell us. But they're talking about building tunnels under cities that have traffic gridlock. Washington, D.C. Ever try to drive in Washington during rush hour? Los Angeles. Some of you love driving through Atlanta. These kind of places. Put a tunnel in, and then the tunnel becomes sort of a high speed car wash. Because when you take your car into a car wash, what happens? You lock it into a track, you put it in neutral, you don't touch the wheel, you don't touch the brake, and what happens? It moves without you. So imagine moving from one side of Los Angeles or Washington to another. With your car in neutral, your hands not on the steering wheel, you don't touch the brake at 100 miles an hour to be able to move traffic. Ain't that cool? All these things that are sophisticated, scientific, and visionary dreams can overcome. Second, if we show someone something that looks impossible, and appears to be outside the realms of science, then they dismiss it as mere sleight of hand. Our eyes are just being tricked by a good magician. We know the girl wasn't really sawn in two as she's waving at us. And we know the pea is really under the middle shell. We just don't know where it is or how the magician is hiding it. We know, right, us sophisticated Americans, we know that there's no such thing as magic because we know that there's no such thing as the supernatural, right? Isn't that what they've been teaching since kindergartners over the past 50 years or more? We know these things. Science, I like science, by the way. Air conditioning, I'm a big fan. Science is the study of the material world. So, in our culture, in order to make sure that science has the last word and is the ultimate source of truth, we have to accept that there is nothing outside the material world. And when we bump into something that doesn't quite fit that narrative, doesn't seem to fully work within the laws of the material world, then we just dismiss it as faulty reasoning or we say that, well, we just need more time and work to solve the problem. We say things like, well, I'm sure there's a reasonable explanation to be found by someone to make my somehow crazy problem fit into my reasonable view of the world, even if it doesn't fit today. Well, many of you know that Kathy and I were at a church in Athens, Georgia, just down the street from the University of Georgia. And, um, the way universities work these days is that if you get your bachelor's and master's at one university, you cannot get a PhD at that same university, and you cannot work at that same university you got your PhD from. Uh, you have to go somewhere else. So there were people there literally from all over the country, all over the world. Uh, one of the leading uh, professors at the uh, School of Veterinary Science was from South Korea. Uh, marvelous, marvelous Christian, uh, and uh, just, just loved him. Um, we had a good friend uh, who was a, a wonderful scientist, uh, one of the top physicists in the world, uh, but he was even a better Christian. And he said the problem with science as the study of the material world is that it's also limiting. Uh, if you think about this table as all of the material world, you can only study what's inside it. You can't study what's on out of, outside of it. So he said, for instance, love cannot be explained by science. 
Now you can you can read what love does physiologically to a person's body. You can cook all of you know and watch their brain waves and watch their blood pressure and, and so forth. But but in a in a room full of, of 40 people, why does this person love that person uniquely in that room? Science doesn't know. And brothers and sisters, if, if God is love, and he is, then science can't explain why. And that's the problem with science. My friend would say, isn't it sad for people who cannot see outside the material world when all the really important things of life are out here? There are so many realities, he would say, that science says are impossible, but yet there they are. Jesus had a number of things to say about the reality of the impossible. How about first his encounter with the rich young ruler? It's found in Matthew chapter 19. The Jews believed that wealth was a sign of God's blessing, a sign of God's favor, and we kind of do that too. We say if we've got a friend or a family member who's done really well and they've got a big house and uh, you know lots of fancy cars and so forth, that God has really blessed them. Well, maybe that's true. Maybe they're just smarter than you. Um, the Jews believe, though, that universally wealth was a sign of God's blessing and favor. So here was a young man who met Jesus who was rich. So automatically everybody assumed that God favored him. And he told Jesus that he had kept all the commandments all the days of his life. But he says to Jesus, I'm still lacking. I'm still lacking. There was an emptiness in his soul that gnawed at him. So he says, teacher, and he asked a great American type question. Teacher, what good thing shall I do to obtain eternal life? Because that's what we always want to know. What do I got to do? You know, what do I got to do? Give me a book to read, 12-step class to take. What do I got to do? What, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And Jesus, Jesus looked into his heart. And Jesus saw the emptiness that was there. And he saw its cause. And in Matthew 19, 21, Jesus says to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell all your possessions and give it to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But when the young man heard this statement, he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to the disciples, Truly I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again I say to you, it is easier, easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Who then can be saved? And looking at them, Jesus said to them, With people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. With people, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Even a rich man can be saved. A rich man like Barnabas, for instance, can be saved. With God, all things are possible. All things. Not some things, not most things, not a few things. With God, all things are impossible. Why? A man could have a severe case of COVID, be given just 
hours to live, be in ICU on a ventilator, and yet be home watching us on Facebook right now. Or a woman could be told, well, not her, her family, that she had a non-survivable brain injury, but yet she's sitting with us in church right now. Amen. Amen. With God, all things are possible. All things are possible. Stick with me. Now, the Gospel of Mark tells us a story that I'm calling the story of the desperate father. You find it in Mark chapter 9. A man had brought his son to be healed by Jesus, but Jesus was away from the main group of disciples. He was up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. And the desperate father asked the disciples to heal the boy, but they failed. So he waited for Jesus to return. So in Mark chapter 9, verse 14, it says, When they came back to the disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and some scribes arguing with them. And immediately when the entire crowd saw him, they were amazed and began running up to greet him. And he asked them, What are you discussing with them? And one of the crowd answered, Notice that the disciples did not answer with what crowd. Teacher, I brought you, my son, possessed with a spirit that, which makes him mute. And, and whenever it seizes him, it slams him to the ground. And he foams at the mouth and grinds his teeth and stiffens. I told your disciples to cast it out and they could not do it. And he answered and said to the disciples, mind you, Oh, unbelieving generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? They failed the test. Bring him to me. They brought the boy to them. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit threw him into a convulsion and falling to the ground, and he began rolling around and foaming at the mouth. And he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. It has often even thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the boy's father cried out, I do believe, help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was rapidly gathering, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying, You deaf and mute spirit, I commend you to come out of him and do not enter him again. And crying out and throwing him into terrible convulsions, it came out. And the boy became so much like a corpse that most of them said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and raised him up. And he got up. When he came into the house, his disciples began questioning him privately. Why did we not drive it out? And he said to them, this kind not come out by anything but prayer. Lord, take pity on us. Help us if you can. If you can, all things are possible to him who believes. All things are possible. Brothers and sisters, this is why you never, ever, ever give up. This is why you always have hope. For all things are possible to the one who believes. Do you have a family member or a friend who is lost and seemingly beyond all reach? All things are possible. Our God is able, and our God can. If it is His will, you will see the reality of the impossible. Like 
Like I said, stick with me. Because if you have the story of a desperate father, you also have the story of a desperate son. Mark chapter 14. It's the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. In Mark chapter 14, verse 36, Jesus is there praying, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Remove this cup from me. Yet, not what I will, but what you will. Jesus is praying to the Father, asking for the cup of death, the cup of crucifixion to pass. He knew that death on the cross was just hours away. The agony of taking all of the sins of the world on himself was very near. Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Yet not what I want. It's not about what I want. It's about your will for my life. It's about what you want. And of course, we, we know that God's will at that moment involves something more, something bigger than just saving Jesus' life, just saving him from suffering. Because God had a bigger plan redeeming and saving the whole world. A little boy was visiting the Civil War battlefield and there were thousands of graves and he and his father were walking along. And the little boy was trying to wrap his brain around the fact that underneath every one of those white stones was a dead man who was killed in battle. And so he asked the perfect little boy question. And you know the question, right? Why? Why do they have to die? And he sort of kind of was asking, didn't God love them? Why, why, why did God let them die? Because God had a bigger plan, a bigger will, more than just one life. Because you see, greater love hath no one than they lay down their life for a friend, for a neighbor, that they lay down their life for the will of God. This is why we need to stay focused in our faith and always bear in mind that God is not some heavenly Santa who exists only to grant our every wish. It's not about our will. It's not about what we want. It has never been that. It has always been about His will and what He is doing and how He is doing the impossible for us, all of us, with us. How He's doing the impossible with us and how it fits in the much larger will beyond our own individual lives. Then we come to the angel, poor little Mary, 
young girl in a small town in a poorly thought of region called Galilee. And the angel tells this little girl that she will bear a son. Now, many currently sophisticated and scientifically minded people want to dismiss all of this as pre-scientific nonsense. All right, okay, so maybe the people in the Bible lived before the days of Isaac Newton. But they knew what, what was what. How can this be, Mary asked in verse 34, right? Since I am a virgin. She didn't need a class in seventh grade biology to figure this out. How can this be? Since I am a virgin. And only a teenage girl would talk back to an angel. <laughs> With a good spirit. And so the angel, the angel says, well, Mary, good question. It's God's doing. See, Mary, God has a plan, a big plan. God has a purpose. And, and Mary, let me just tell you, if God could create the whole world in six days, having a virgin conceive and bear a child is not too much for him. Amen. Mary, look at your old cousin, Elizabeth. Old, barren, never having children, right? Mary, she is six months pregnant. For God, Mary, Nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing, Mary. The blind will see, the deaf will hear, the lame will walk, the dead will rise, sinners will be forgiven, sinners will be saved. Mary, nothing will be impossible with God. Nothing will be Possible with God. This may be the most important verse in all Scripture. Because, brothers and sisters, with God, the impossible becomes reality. Don't ever give up hope. Don't ever give up hope. No, he's not some heavenly Santa who makes every wish come true. And yes, we may pray desperately for this, and the answer may be no. He told his own son, no. I'm not gonna let the cup pass. Paul, there was probably no one closer to God than Paul, and Paul prayed three times for help, and the answer was no, my grace is sufficient for you. David wanted to build the temple, and the answer was no, that's for someone else. He's got a bigger plan, he's got a bigger picture. In our limited mind, in our limited vision, we can't see it all. But we should always remember that even when the answer is no, it still comes from the deepest part of his love for us. Even if it hurts. Even if our heart breaks. His no to us is the best way to love us. And that may not make a lot of sense to us a lot of the time. But don't you remember when you were really small, three years old, four years old? And things that your parents said didn't make a lot of sense. I don't want to move. 
I like my house. I like my school. Why am I having to move? I hate liver. Why do I have to eat it? It comes out of a parent's love for a child. And our Father in heaven loves you more than you will ever know. When he makes the impossible a reality with a great big yes in your life, even when he says no, his love for you is more than you will ever, ever know. Let's pray. Lord, you are an awesome God, and we are blessed. Miracles happen every day, all around us. And we are thankful and grateful. <clears throat> and even when the answer is no, even when it hurts, even when we have to walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your love for us does not let us go alone, but you walk through the valley with us. And we don't think it's possible for us to go on one more step. And then one day we stop and we look around and we see that we're not in the valley anymore. And behind us, there's just one set of footprints that we don't understand. And you point out that those footprints are yours. There's only one set because you were carrying us. So, Father, be with us. Bring your reality of the impossible with us every day. Help us to see. Help us to have hope. Help us to never, ever give up. Because you aren't done yet. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for being with us. I stand before you. Amen. Let us stand for this final song.
So this is 